Thank you. I would uh, urge all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion in her name. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, violence against women and girls is one of the most devastating and fundamental violations of human rights. It has to stop and we all have to take meaningful action to stop it. This debate marks the annual 16 Days of Action to tackle gender-based violence across the world. The theme of this year's 16 Days is Leave No One Behind. And I take this to mean two things. Firstly, that no woman or girl should endure any form of gender-based violence. And we need to make sure that we include every part of our society in our efforts to end it. Secondly, that we all in this parliament and in our society have a responsibility to take action to end violence against women. And it is time for everyone to realise that we are collectively responsible for eradicating violence against women and girls and the underlying attitudes and inequalities that perpetuate it. And we must work together uh, and we must leave no one behind. I want to make clear, President Officer, from the outset that it is men who must change their behaviour and their choices. Men must join with the, the many women already taking action in this space to send a very clear message. In every space that men occupy, they must act to support women's equality and stand up to violence, harassment and abuse. And we have all been moved by the, the stories told through the, the Me Too hashtag on social media, which has prompted uh, thousands of women to disclose that they too have been victims of sexual harassment or assault. And I'd like to pay tribute to and acknowledge uh, the bravery of those women and men who have raised their hands and said, me too. It is not easy. And we cannot forget that there are many more who have not shared their experiences publicly. And each individual is entitled to deal with their own experience uh, in their own way. And if the Me Too hashtag has achieved anything, it is indeed to shine a spotlight on men's violence against women and emphasise that we cannot take our foot off the gas. And it's brought home the reality that no institution is immune from the scourge of sexual harassment. Tackling violence against women and girls is the role of every individual, every community and every institution of Scotland. And the Scottish Government is committed to leading a collective response and playing our part to make this happen. And that's why on Friday, uh, we published a delivery plan to identify and implement uh, the very practical steps that will take us towards ending this violence for good. And the delivery plan sets out 118 actions that we intend to take from now to 2021 to ensure that we can make progress towards a Scotland where women and children live free from violence and abuse and uh, the attitudes and inequalities that perpetuate it. Our work in this area, presiding officer, has a very deliberate and decisive focus on prevention. And that is why over the next period we will run a number of campaigns, including on the new domestic abuse offence, as well as sexual harassment and sexism. Feminist organisations like Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland and Gender, Close the Gap and Zero Tolerance rightly challenge us all to do more as well as raise awareness and understanding across society. Ensuring that our young people have the, the right attitudes and an understanding of consent uh, is critical for the future. That's why we're expanding the Rape Crisis Scotland Sexual Violence Prevention Programme to all 32 local authorities in Scotland. On Friday, I was delighted to visit St John Ogilvie's High School in Hamilton, which is the, the first of what will be eight schools over the next few years that we are supporting to develop a holistic approach uh, to tackling gender-based violence. It was uh, fantastic to hear directly from the students how committed they are to these issues. Uh, and I believe that the school will certainly blaze a trail which hopefully many others will follow. And we must ensure that we build on the work that we are doing to give our children and our young people the very best start in life. And that's why the delivery plan has a strong focus on education for young people and improving experience of the justice system for children and strengthening links uh, with their work in child protection. And just recently, I was very privileged to meet a group of young people called the Everyday Heroes, uh, who've been working closely with us to, to shape Equally Safe. 
And their recommendations for action will be published in early 2018 and I will be uh, responding uh, to them. Uh, these are fantastic young people and I would encourage uh, other members across the chamber to engage with this group of young people as their voices should be heard uh, and their views listened to. We need to harness the power of all our educational facilities and we must make sure that our further and higher education campuses are free of this violence. And I want to take this moment to mention the tragic case of Emily Drewey, just 18 years old and in her first year at university. She was uh, found dead in her flat in March uh, last year, having taken her own life. And this serves to remind us that colleges and universities, like every other institution and community, have their share of men's violence against women. So we need to do more, and that's why we will work with universities and colleges to support them in using the learning from our Equally Safe and Higher Education project at the University of Strathclyde to ensure the safety of students from gendered violence and embed better understanding of these issues uh, into their curriculums. And I want to pay tribute to Fiona, uh, Emily's mother, who has campaigned uh, along with the National Union of Students for universities to tackle these issues on campus and to provide better support for students. And my colleague, uh, Shirley Ann Somerville, the Minister for Further and Higher Education and Science, has offered to meet with Fiona and I know that she will give careful consideration to the important matters uh, raised by this heartbreaking case. Signing officer, raising awareness and embedding understanding are important, but the bigger challenge is delivering a societal shift where women no longer occupy a subordinate position to men. And this government has a strong track record, a gender balanced cabinet, the establishment of an advisory council on women and girls, and the introduction of legislation to lock in the gains on ensuring uh, equal representation on public boards are just a few of the important steps we are taking. This is a matter of human rights enshrined within the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which states that we have a duty to provide women on equal terms with men the right to participate in government and public office uh, at all levels. And we take a responsibility to uphold these rights seriously and to do so demands action to ensure that women are properly represented in our political and public institutions and more widely in senior and decision-making positions. Of course, we know that in terms of equal representation, we're not there yet. Uh, just less than 35% of members of this Scottish Parliament and 30% of MPs are women. And at the current pace of change, it will be another 25 years before we reach 50% uh, of women elected members in local government. So I think we all know that we have a lot more to do. And that's why the delivery plan sets out a series of steps that we believe will help make progress towards advancing women's equality uh, in a range of spaces, whether economic, civil, social and cultural. And we also want women to feel safer in every space uh, that they wish to inhabit and part of this is about holding men to account for their behaviour in real and online spaces and that's why we will work with local community safety partners to link Equally Safe to their work and hold a round table with experts to look at what more we can do to tackle the pernicious uh, online abuse and misogyny uh, that women using social media uh, often experience. Sign officer, prevention is absolutely vital if we are to reduce and ultimately end violence against women and girls, but we also need to act here and now to ensure that those experiencing violence and abuse uh, get the help and support that they need. And we want to make sure that public services work together effectively to support victims and survivors and put the rights of victims and survivors at the very heart of their approach. And we recognise the important role that local specialist third sector services play, which is why we are providing three years funding for those organisations uh, to enable them to plan for the future. And we are investing significant funding in tackling violence against women and girls. And for this year, I've committed nearly £12 million from my own portfolio to support services and tackle the underlying issues that create the conditions for violence. The £20 million invested by my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, over the last three years to strengthen the justice response to tackling violence against women has been used to good effect to reduce criminal court waiting times, 
strengthen advocacy support across the country for victims of sexual violence and develop the capacity uh, of perpetrator programmes. But as I said at the outset, presiding officer, it is uh, men that need to change their behaviour and their choices if we are to end violence against women and girls. And if they do not do so, then it is right that they receive uh, a robust response from justice services. And that's why we are strengthening the law in relation to domestic abuse by making coercive and controlling behaviour a criminal offence to, to reflect the reality of domestic abuse. And we've already passed the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016, which modernises the law on domestic and sexual abuse and created a specific offence of sharing private intimate images uh, without consent. And we also need to make sure that those men who are willing to change their behaviour get the support that they need. So we will expand the Caledonian programme to ensure that male offenders uh, can receive those interventions. To conclude, presiding officer, a lot has been done. Uh, we are doing important work in this area and I welcome very much the broad cross-party consensus uh, on this agenda. But there is much, much more to be done and we cannot rest until violence against women and girls is indeed uh, a thing of the past. And I want to end with a quote from Frums Fumzilla Malama Nukuka, uh, the executive director of UN Women, who once said that the price of no change is unacceptable and I'm sure that we would all concur with that. That has been thrown very much into sharp focus by recent events in particular uh, and this government uh, commits to moving forward and working tirelessly to ensuring that every woman and girl in Scotland uh, lives free from violence and I move the motion in my name. Sorry, no, sir. Thank you, Anna Colin. Adam Tompkins to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I very much welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate and to support the Scottish Government's motion. Um, speaking personally, I particularly uh, like the line in it, calling on men everywhere to stand shoulder to shoulder with women and sending a clear message uh, that violence against women and girls is never acceptable. Certainly this man stands shoulder to shoulder with everybody in this chamber um, on that. Presiding Officer, Sunday marked the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, an annual campaign that has run for more than 15 years. It also marked the start of 2017's 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign. Uh, this is an opportunity for us as parliamentarians uh, to not only increase public awareness, but to take stock, to evaluate progress, and to redouble our efforts. In doing so, we'll no doubt hear many sobering statistics in the Chamber this afternoon. We know, for example, that last year, Police Scotland received on average more than 160 calls a day reporting domestic violence. But there has been a 66% rise in the number of reported rapes and attempted rapes since 2010, and that almost 200 women and girls were forced into marriage in Scotland over a four-year period, with more than a third of those taking place in my own city of Glasgow. These figures serve as a stark reminder of the scale of the problem we still face. In fact, incidences are, much, are likely much higher due to non-reporting. But statistics tell only a part of the story, a small part of the story. They cannot possibly convey the horror of being violently abused in your own home, the betrayal of being sexually assaulted by someone you know, the trauma of being forced into a marriage while you're still in school uniform. Survivors have shown tremendous strength and resilience, and I echo the Cabinet Secretary's thanks and appreciation of those activists and organisations, uh, Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland, Victim Support Scotland, Bernardo's, and many others who support them. The Scottish Conservatives stand with the Scottish and UK governments as they work to eradicate gender-based violence at home and abroad. We know, for example, that one of the major challenges to efforts to prevent and uh, to prevent uh, and end violence against women and girls worldwide is the substantial funding shortfall. That's why DFID's recent commitment to provide up to £12 million over three years to the United Nations Trust Fund in support of actions to eliminate violence against women and indeed the Scottish Government's additional £1 million for the equally safe strategy are particularly welcome. The additional UK aid announced last week by our new International Development Secretary, Penny Mordaunt, is expected to help some 750,000 women and girls around the world. Now, the Prime Minister often talks about the good that government can do. Well, this, it seems to me, is a first-class example. Also welcome 
was the news in October that the disclosure scheme for domestic abuse in Scotland, Clare's Law, has led to more than 900 people being told over the past two years that their partner has an abusive past. Ruth Davidson and my Scottish Conservative colleagues pushed hard for this scheme to be introduced north of the border after it was rolled out in England and Wales in 2014. The initiative is another piece in the jigsaw offering extra protection to women at risk of domestic violence. And it's very positive to see it working so effectively. But as the Cabinet Secretary rightly said, there is so much more to be done. The Scottish Government is rightly finding ways to tackle the scourge of gender-based violence, but this process is impeded if the agencies on the ground are ill-equipped to cope with increasing demand. The thematic review of the investigation and prosecution of sexual crimes has raised a number of concerns in this regard, with victims of sexual violence variously reporting that the court system is, and I quote, degrading and terrifying, and that their ordeal in court was, and again I quote, worse than the rape itself. After taking the brave step to report the crime, the review found that a high number of victims disengage during the criminal justice process. And, presiding officer, this isn't good enough. And this parliament must monitor progress by the Crown Office urgently to address these criticisms. The theme for 2017's campaign against gender-based violence is leave no one behind, an imperative to support those women and girls most vulnerable to gender-based violence, including ethnic minorities, those living with disabilities, migrants and refugees, and those in humanitarian crises as a result of conflict or natural disaster. So it's concerning, therefore, that respondents to the consultation on the Equally Safe Delivery Plan feel that it has fallen short in relation to who it should cover, including women and girls with additional vulnerabilities. And, presiding officer, I make this point not to criticise or to condemn, but as an MSP for the Glasgow region, currently the only asylum dispersal area in Scotland. The British Red Cross, with whom I met and spoke last week, assisted more than 2,500 refugees and asylum seekers last year in Glasgow. Some are women who have experienced violence in their country of origin or on their journey to the United Kingdom. And on arrival, their level of vulnerability can be heightened by intense difficulties accessing services. These are women very much at risk of exploitation and abuse. But the National Framework to Eliminate Gender-Based Violence does not fully identify their additional vulnerabilities nor adequately respond to them. The Scottish Government has recognised stakeholder feedback uh, that the delivery plan needs to be improved in this area and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could shed further light on this issue when she winds up for the Government later this afternoon. On female genital mutilation too, the Scottish Government could and in our view should go further. Even though female genital mutilation has been explicitly illegal since 1985, there has never been a successful prosecution in Scotland. The National Action Plan on FGM commits to raise awareness of female genital mutilation among teachers and medical practitioners, to add to the national guidance for child protection, and for Police Scotland to issue internal guidance on so-called, I don't like this phrase at all, but so-called honour-based violence. Those are positive steps. And I welcome them, but why not go further, as the Scottish Conservatives uh, have called for, and introduce court-ordered female genital mutilation protection orders, a mandatory reporting duty, lifelong anonymity for victims, a criminal offence of failing to protect your daughter, and statutory guidance, not just ad hoc guidance, but statutory guidance for professionals. All of these have been implemented south of the border. Why not also here too? Presiding officer, it's fair to say that we have made good progress on tackling gender-based violence in recent years, but there is evidently further that we can go and more to be done yet. And in that spirit, we support the government's motion this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on Claire Baker to open for the Labour Party. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, this afternoon's debate is important, and I'm pleased it is taking place during the UN's 16 Days of Action to End Violence Against Women and Girls. While the motion before us today has a largely domestic context, the significance of this week reminds us of the global importance of this campaign and the plights being faced by women and girls across the world who face daily experiences of threats of violence and sexual exploitation. And gender-based violence is constant, in times of conflict and in times of peace. It will try to damage, destroy and demean women and girls. At the heart of this is inequality. And societies where women and girls continue to be unequal in social, economic and political realms, 
where they are powerless, limited or restricted, cannot fully challenge and change this culture. But the 16 Days of Action supports empowerment of women and girls and challenges political leadership to take action. The voice from this Parliament must be clear and unequivocal that while we address the challenges at home, we are doing so in solidarity with all women and girls across the world. This year's theme, Leave No One Behind, End Violence Against Women and Girls, encapsulates this responsibility. We believe that we live in a tolerant, inclusive society, and these are the values that we promote. But the reality of our society is that gender inequality still exists. It exists in the workplace, in the home, in the worlds of sport and education. This inequality in our society is the root for the growth of gender-based violence. In recent years, we have seen the reporting of rape, sexual assault and domestic violence all increase. Almost 11,000 sexual offences were reported last year, a rise of 5% on the previous year. And I know that significant efforts have been made by Police Scotland and other agencies to support reporting of these crimes. And this can be argued as an explanation for the increase. But I fear that we are seeing a shift in the types of crime being committed, with a greater focus on intimate, personal crimes being committed against partners, friends, acquaintances, overwhelmingly women, many of which are not reported. As part of the 16 days, Rape Crisis Scotland have been providing snapshots and yesterday tweeted that, on the 9th of October 2017, 246 people received support from local rape crisis centres in Scotland. This year, rape and sexual abuse Perth and Kinross celebrate their 10th year and they held a fantastic exhibition called Inside Outside, which was informative, engaging, moving and ultimately hopeful. It showed the trauma of rape, sexual assault and sexual exploitation, but also showed the resilience and recovery that they support. Part of their work is in schools, challenging gender stereotypes and expectations, discussing consent, working to change the culture that young people are experiencing. And last week we had the announcement of the chair of the expert group on preventing sexual offending among children and young people with an emphasis on prevention. And this is a welcome appointment which provides a focus for this difficult discussion. But alongside the research, there are people working every day with children and young people to address these issues and the need to be supported. And I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary talk about the funding specifically for work in schools. Bernardo Scotland have emphasised the need for children and young pe people of all ages to have access to high quality education around health and wellbeing, including healthy relationships and gender equality. The review of PSE is ongoing, but it gives us an opportunity to address gender inequality. Bernardo's Children First and NSPCC also make strong points about child sexual abuse and child sexual exploitation, which the Cabinet Secretary may wish to address. The recent focus on exposing sexual harassment and assault within the film industry, the media, politics, demonstrates the protectionalism that justifies this type of behaviour. The resultant Me Too social media campaign showed that it was widespread. The typically weaker position of women in the workplace, which leads to fears over position, employment and status if they speak out, indicates that we have some way to go to achieve equality. We can see international examples where other more equal societies in terms of gender have challenged these, um, these norms at a very early age. And if anything, our society, largely but not exclusively through marketing and commercialisation, have increased the gender identity and expectations on our children and young people. The emphasis is more on difference than on equality, and this underpins the power structures we live within. Equally safe is welcome as the strategic direction to address these challenges. Recognising all forms of violence against women and girls offers a holistic approach to the problem. The action plan is welcome, but it must be properly resourced and widely disseminated and adopted. The work on domestic abuse is welcome, and as the bill progresses through Parliament, I hope we can strengthen it and address the availability of specialist courts so women can access a meaningful justice. But there are concerns that the strategy is too focused on one area and needs to look wider. The area of sex exploitation is one area where we could be bolder. My colleague Rhoda Grant has shown her commitment to tackling this issue and we'll talk a bit more about proposals that were brought forward in her Members Bill in the last session. I know there is interest across the Chamber in this issue and that is welcome. The briefing from Zero Tolerance expressed disappointment that the Equally Safe Delivery Plan does not set out clear actions for how Scotland will prevent all forms of commercial sexual exploitation. Largely exploiting vulnerable women and young girls, 
Zero tolerance highlight that around half of women become involved at age 18 or younger, and as many as 80% of women are working in flats, saunas or parlours, and not originally from the UK. I fear that these are forgotten women, that we don't do enough to disrupt this industry, which has clear links to human trafficking, and there's not enough provision and support for women who often have language barriers, drug and alcohol addiction problems and mental health problems. There's not enough support for these women who are looking to escape from this life. So, President Officer, I look forward to this afternoon's debate and the contribution from all MSPs. Thank you. We now move to the open part of the debate, and we start with Ruth Maguire to be followed by Annie Wells. Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a privilege to contribute to such an important debate, and I'd like to begin by welcoming the Equally Safe Delivery Plan published last week. We're debating that plan during the global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Gender-based violence encompasses a whole continuum of violence perpetrated against women and girls, from sexual harassment to domestic abuse, from rape to sexual assault, and from commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking for that purpose to so-called honour crimes. The theme this year is Leave No One Behind, End Violence Against Women and Girls. And, presiding officer, the year that we can speak to and pursue the aims of that theme with no caveats and with no whataboutery will be the year that we know that society has truly acknowledged and understood the magnitude of men's violence against women and girls. And that will be the year that we can move forward. It's important to be really clear that we are not there yet. We've not achieved gender equality and violence and against women and girls wherever it is on the scale, is both a cause and a symptom of this inequality. There won't be a woman in this place or outside whose life hasn't been negatively affected in some way or another. It might not be all men, but it is all women. The Equally Safe Delivery Plan is to be welcomed. It builds on successes already achieved and actions already underway to set out 118 diverse and bold actions across four priority areas. These range from an expansion of Rape Crisis Scotland's sexual violence protect, prevention programme in schools to the piloting of an equally safe employer accreditation scheme aimed at tackling gender-based violence in the workplace. Presiding officer, I've spoken about my concerns about commercial sexual exploitation in this chamber before, and I reiterate my position that as long as sexual access to women and girls can be bought and sold as if we were objects, there can be no real equality and no real social justice. I was glad to read that as part of the delivery plan, the Women's Support Network will deliver a challenging demand programme to raise awareness of commercial sexual exploitation and build capacity across organisations to address it. I also welcome the Scottish Government's commitment in the plan to considering how it could enhance support for service providers, supporting harm reduction and exit for those engaged in prostitution. At the same time, though, I'm worried that these action points don't go nearly far enough and do not tackle the issue at root cause, which is male demand. Presiding officer, primary prevention is rightly a key priority of the strategy, ensuring that interventions are early, effective and maximise the safety of women and girls. But when it comes to commercial sexual exploitation, I'm sorry to say that the action points appear to fall a bit short of the mark in that regard. The focus in the delivery plan appears to be on supporting women in prostitution to exit, reducing the harms associated with this kind of violence, as opposed to preventing women from being exploited in the first place and tackling root causes. Where the delivery plan does refer to the issues that can lead to someone becoming exploited in this way, it can feel a bit vague and non-committal. But most significantly, it conspicuously fails to acknowledge the single root cause of commercial sexual exploitation, and that is male demand. Another priority area in the delivery plan is about ensuring that men desist from all forms of violence against women and girls, and that perpetrators of such violence receive a robust and effective response. But when it comes to commercial sexual exploitation, there is no clear action point under this priority. The Scottish Government is clear that commercial sexual exploitation is a form of violence against women. Surely the next logical step is to criminalise those who perpetrate this violence. Male demand, the root cause of commercial sexual exploitation, has to be explicitly and robustly addressed. 
because as long as it's legal to purchase sexual access to our bodies, men will continue to perpetrate this violence against women with impunity. And our fight for real equality and justice will remain heavily compromised. If we don't act, we simply will not achieve our end goal of eradicating violence against women. We will not hold perpetrators of violence against them to account, and we will not radically change attitudes towards women, something we all acknowledge is needed. I appreciate that the Scottish Government has recently commissioned an evidence assessment of the impacts of criminalisation, the results of which were inconclusive. In the absence of clear empirical evidence, though, we must be guided by what we deem to be right and wrong, by our own convictions on the issue. This is a point made in the review itself, to quote from it. Ultimately, the absence of conclusive evidence is likely to require decision-making based on political standpoint and consideration of the policy context and framework in which any potential intervention is required. If our own political standpoint is that prostitution is a form of violence against women and girls, the next logical step is clear to me. In this place, we won't always get an ambiguous and, obje and objective evidence that tells us exactly what to do. Sometimes we have to put our heads above the parapet and fight for what we simply believe to be the right thing. Thank you. I call on Annie Wells to be followed by Kate Forbes. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am once again pleased to speak in this debate marking the Unite campaign's 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Transcending borders and cultures, gender-based violence is a global issue affecting millions of people every year. To reflect on the horrific situations millions of women and girls find themselves in around the world, is sometimes almost too difficult to comprehend, which, uh, which is why I'm pleased we can come together as MSPs to speak honestly about the issues that lie ahead in what can sometimes seem like an insurmountable task. Hinting at the scale of the global problem, this year's theme, Leave No One Behind, reinforces the need to commit to a world free from violence for all women and girls, reaching those who are most underserved and marginalised, often blighted by war, natural disasters, and a societal attitude towards women, which can render them socially and economically vulnerable. Data from a survey carried out in 87 countries between 2005 and 2016 showed us that 19% of women between 15 and 49 years of age had experienced physical or sexual violence by a partner in the 12 months prior to the survey. Further to this, female genital mutilation too remains a global problem. The practice has declined by 24% since around 2000, but in countries where it remains prevalent, it's estimated that more than one in three girls aged between 15 and 19 are still undergoing this unnecessary procedure. I am pleased that the extra UK aid was announced this weekend, which will assist 750,000 women and girls over the next three years by increasing access to crucial services like legal assistance, health care and counselling. I also welcome the UK's push to eradicate gender-based violence through its 127 programmes, tackling this abuse in its many forms, including prevention of and response to domestic violence, acid attacks, FGM and child early and forced marriage. I am proud that the UK government is playing a re leading role in tackling these issues around the world and it's only by raising awareness and taking serious action that we will continue to see progress against gender-based violence. Domestically, there is still a perpetual problem to deal with and I fully support the Scottish Government as it works to eradicate violence against women and girls. I welcome the additional £1 million funding announced for the Equally Safe budget as a means of teaching school children the importance of consent and healthy relationships and creating consistency across our local authorities as Rape Crisis Scotland's sexual violence programme is rolled out further. There are worrying trends for domestic violence with the latest statistics showing a 1% rise to nearly 59,900 incidents in 2016-17. There were also nearly 2,000 rapes or attempted rapes recorded to the police in Scotland last year, a 4% rise from the previous year 
and a 66% rise from 2010-11. And whilst I absolutely recognise that it is due to an increase in reporting, it is with concern that I note the need for continued improvement in access to support services. Although I, of course, was pleased to see Glasgow Archway Centre receive funding, a funding boost of £445,000, which will allow the Sexual Assault Referral Clinic to expand its opening hours until midnight, five days of the week. I would like to highlight the scope for the model to be replicated across the country. When Archway was opened almost a decade ago, it was signalled as the first of many clinics across Scotland, giving victims access to a one-stop shop where all the services needed could be easily accessed. And I would urge the Scottish Government to look at rolling this out further. Furthermore, when it comes to FGM, an issue that is believed to affect 170,000 girls across the UK, while I will, of course, always support a consensual approach, it's important that we work together and improve upon how we respond to and prevent its practice in our country. No one wants to see this barbaric pra practice take place in Scotland. And echoing comments I made back in a debate on FGM in February, I would urge the Scottish Government to take on board calls for initiatives that have already taken place in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, including statutory reporting for, prof for professionals, protection orders, and the creating of new criminal offence for parents and guardians who tolerate and facilitate FGM. Finally, I would like to draw attention to some of the local initiatives in my area, which help to drive greater public understanding and help generate a national conversation. In Glasgow, supporters attending a Glasgow Warriors match at Scotland next month will be invited to sign the White Ribbon Scotland Pledge as part of the city's 16 Days of Action a request which will no doubt give food for thought for thousands of people who may otherwise may never have heard about the 16-day campaign. To conclude, there is a lot of positive and decisive work being done both locally and nationally as we bid to eradicate gender-based violence. I warmly welcome the Scottish Government's extra funding and the honest discussions and contributions we have and will hear from members today in the Chamber on what is such a very difficult topic. This is not an easy subject, but it's one I am pleased has been brought forward for debate today and one I hope we will all continue to tackle head on. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a woman, it is my right, a right in terms of entitlement and a right in terms of morality, it is my right that I should not be subjected to violence, domestic abuse, rape, sexual assault, commercial sexual exploitation, or honour-based violence. And neither should the one in three women worldwide who are sexually or physically assaulted over the course of their lifetime. The 16 days of activism, activism against gender-based violence ends on Human Rights Day for a reason because women are every bit as human and every bit as deserving of respect and equal treatment. They are every bit as deserving of rights to dignity, rights of protection, to freedoms, freedom to believe, to learn, to express, freedom to move and to marry whom they please. And until women have those freedoms in every community across this planet, we will continue to observe and recognise the 16 Days campaign every single year. Women are human and they are entitled to the fundamental freedoms inherent to all humanity. And that may be stating the obvious. And yet globally today, almost 40% of all murders of women are committed by male partners. And in Scotland, just over half of the female victims of homicides were killed by their partner or ex-partner. For male victims, it was 6%. And if there was ever a more sobering figure that highlights that Scotland is not exempt from violence against women or the scourge of gender-based abuse, it is that. And one of the real strengths of the 16 Days campaign is that it starts with local activism. It could start in a small village in rural Scotland. It can be discussed in this parliament. But we join with activists across the world to say that gender-based violence is not inevitable. It is abnormal and we condemn it. 
I quote Kofi Annan's comments in 1999, which was eight years after the first 16 Days campaign was launched in 1991. He said, violence against women is perhaps the most shameful human rights violation, and it is perhaps the most pervasive. It knows no boundaries of geography, culture, or, or wealth. As long as it continues, we cannot claim to be making real progress towards equality, development, and peace. And so I am glad that this parliament is joining with women and men across the planet to condemn the trellis of inequality on which grows the poisonous suffocating ivy of violence and abuse, beneath which men shelter comfortably, knowing their deeds will go unpunished, and in which women die at the hands of their partners. Presiding officer, I, like others in this chamber, want to put on the record that I utterly condemn the cultural and community norms that ascribe lower status to women and make violence acceptable. I condemn the domestic partners who still believe that their abuse is justified and okay because everybody else does it, or because they couldn't control themselves, or because of inebriation and drug use. And I condemn the way that we continue to fail women in need because help isn't there when it's desperately needed, either because the public justice system across the world is broken, corrupt, and dysfunctional, or because women don't believe it will make a jot of difference if they speak up. What is worse than knowing that you need help and yet knowing that if you ask for it, it will not come? For every woman whose voice we heard during the Me Too campaign and for every woman whose story we read with great gratitude to them for their bravery in speaking up, for every woman, there are hundreds of thousands more who live in fear or live with the consequences of violence. Violence for one reason, violence because they are women. The acts of violence will differ, but at the end of the day, this is about the women whose only crime is to be born a woman in a world that still sees fit to abuse and attack them. And on this, I want to pay tribute to one of my invincible colleagues, Ash Denham, for her fearless definition of prostitution as violence against women and her unswerving determination to end commercial sex sexual exploitation. And I pay tribute to Rhoda Grant too um, and to other MSPs, including Ruth Maguire, who continue to pursue this and will pursue this until they have succeeded in protecting what Claire Baker called the forgotten women. And I fully agree in closing with Ruth Maguire's comments that caring for women exiting sexual exploitation is important, it's fundamentally important, but it doesn't deal with the core problem. And that problem is that we are raising today and that we have raised in every day of the 16 days campaign and that we will raise every single day until we've succeeded in solving this. That real problem is male violence against women. It must end, it will only end if we identify what the core problem is. And I join with women across the world today in saying that we utterly condemn that violence that is perpetrated. Thank you. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This debate's an annual event marking the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Violence against women is rooted in women's inequality. Every time we take a step to counter that inequality, it feels like a new front opens up. This year, we've been faced with revelations from every walk of life of sexual harassment of women in the workplace, a practice used by some men to undermine women, to put women in their place, a place that says they cannot progress their career without providing sexual favours a place that they should always know remains submissive to men. Up until a couple of months ago, women speaking out about harassment would have been quickly denounced, her career over, marked as a troublemaker or a prude. Maybe it does show a step forward that this is no longer the case, but it does show very vividly the despicable behaviour that has gone unchallenged for far too long. We need true equality to ensure that this can't happen to another woman. This is, and this change of culture must be led by men as well as women. 
The vast majority of men are horrified by this behaviour. They have to speak out now. Sexual abuse is not a woman's problem. It's a problem with some men. Our society must also stop giving out mixed messages. We must stand for total equality and have zero tolerance to all aspects of violence against women. Surely it's a mixed message to say that it's okay for men to buy a woman in prostitution, but it's not okay for men to demand sexual favours to enhance a woman's career. Both are wrong, both should not be tolerated. This stark inequality demeans women. Until we put it right, we will continue to be plagued by violence against women, which is a symptom of an unequal society. As we look at other countries, we can see clearly that those who prohibit the purchase of sex create more equal societies. Those societies have equal pay, equal maternity and paternity leave. They're much fairer societies because of it. Basic human respect for our fellow humans breeds kinder societies and the willingness to work together for the greater good. It's no coincidence that domestic abuse starts with financial control, followed by degrading behaviour and physical and sexual violence. This is a process that the perpetrator takes to gain control of their victim. As a society, we must not tolerate that in any guise. No human should have control over another, and we must build fair and respect respectful societies. In Scotland, we've provided, prided ourselves on our measures to combat violence against women, and indeed, we are legislating again on coercive control, but we still have a long way to go. Ireland, North and South, have made the purchase of sex illegal, and this has led to more trafficking of women to Scotland to free, feed prostitution, and this is something we warned of at the time. We really need to deal with prostitution in a way that has equality at its core. Currently, our laws penalise those forced into prostitution. They do nothing whatsoever to protect them. They are the people penalised and criminalised, while those who feed the industry walk away scot-free. It's simply not good enough to, to just say that prostitution is wrong, it's a form of violence against women, but then do absolutely nothing at all to stop it. Equally Safe makes it clear that violence against women includes commercial sexual exploitation, including prostitution, lap dancing, stripping, pornography and trafficking. There are a majority of members of this parliament whose party policy is to criminalise those who would buy sex and to de decriminalise those who sell. Prostitution feeds off poverty, which is growing. Poverty makes people vulnerable and they struggle to survive. Prostitution also feeds off abuse. It's no coincidence that those working with survivors of childhood sexual abuse find many of them have also been prostituted. Treated as objects for someone else's gratification in their childhood leads them into the same as adults. Some argue that every aspect of prostitution should be decriminalised. Pimps and brothel keepers should be free to abuse without sanction. If prostitution was legalised, it would be okay, would it be okay for a career advisor to recommend it as a job? Would it be okay to sanction somebody if they turned down work as a prostitute? It is women predominantly who are exploited, but some men are too. But what is clear, however, that is always men who do the exploiting. Can I ask every member to consider why, whether prostitution is okay for them, for their parents, for their partner, or for their children? I'm going to ask you to do something that I heard Linda Thompson from the Women's Support Project tell an audience, and it really brought home the reality of prostitution to me. She told us all, when you leave here today, take note of the next 10 men you meet. What would it take for you to sell sex to them? How desperate would you need to be? And what price would you accept? Now tell me that that is a choice, a simple transaction between buyer and seller. Frankly, if it's not good enough for you and yours, it's not good enough for anyone. Call John Finney to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Uh, like many others, I'm very pleased to speak in this debate, and I think, as Rhoda Grant said, 
this call for men to speak out. And as Ruth McGuire said, it may not be all men, but it's certainly all women and girls that are affected by the subject that we're talking about here. So I'm very happy to lend support to the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's motion and um, note that it talks about the global 16 days of activism. It's quite clear that the problems that are being uh, alluded to by colleagues are uh, worldwide. Um, and it is gender-based violence we're talking about, and I almost feel I should start every speech of this nature by uh, apologising for my gender. But what I think is important is that um, men do speak out. Um, so I, I welcome the publication of the Scottish Government's delivery plan and it will go some way to uh, addressing underlying attitudes. Of course, there's a lot of work still requires to be done. I'm very grateful to the various organisations for the briefings. Uh, I'm going to quote from Children First a couple of times. They talk about the domestic abuse bill that my colleague Rhoda Grant referred to and I. Two of them on the Justice Committee and see this as one way that we're going to make things a little bit better. And they say it represents a vital step forward in tackling gender-based violence and in recognising the impact of this type of violence on children. Because, of course, <clears throat> it's not simply the, the, the spouse or partner that's affected by this. It's the entire household, and it goes often much beyond that. Now, there's a lot of good work that's been undertaken by the Scottish Government, indeed by the third sector, in, in relation to this. And as many have heard me speak in, in debates of this nature before, my point of reference is the police service in the mid-70s. And my word, um, what a transformation we've seen there, uh, all for the good, um, so much better. Um, and um, it is because that recognises, and the organisations now recognise the, the far-reaching impact of violence against women and girls. And that continues, and I think there are a number of subjects that some of us wouldn't necessarily have felt very comfortable talking about in, in days gone past, but actually the exposure around issues like female genital mutilation, the growing awareness of human trafficking and um, the signs of that. And, and I always, if I write this phrase down, put heavy inverted commas around it because I find it um, a deeply offensive term. Honour-based violence, again, is, is something that, uh, as if by some method uh, of putting a couple of words in, that that uh, offsets the, the word violence. Um, but the focus has to be in prevention, it has to be in protection, and it has to be in recovery. And professional training is key to that. And um, um, for not the first time, I'll, I'll uh, talk about judicial training or the lack thereof or the voluntary element that's I understand part of it. It's a crucial issue. It's an absolutely crucial issue, particularly for the judiciary to understand the relationship between the criminal law and the civil law and how closely they interrelate and how we all talk about access to justice, how justice should be there for the victims of domestic violence and the mere involvement of the criminal justice or the civil legal system should not further victimise these individuals. Um, um, and, and, of course, uh, we talk about women and girls, but, of course, it's, it's children of both genders that are affected by this. And uh, there are some structural and systemic problems that perpetrate this. Um, um, and I, I can't recall, uh, perhaps it's more than one colleague that's talked about the, the role education would play in this, and particularly in relation to respect. I think you can achieve a lot by saying treat everyone with respect, regardless of uh, uh, um, any qualification, not having to, 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 to describe further. And key to that would be the, the teaching of consent and... Uh, the growing awareness that there is that uh, um, that's being disregarded. And of course, it has to be age appropriate, but it has to be addressed. We can't have any, any um, area or any part of, for instance, the Highlands and Islands where this issue isn't a tackled head on because these problems are universal. And also, um, children's rights and wellbeing impact assessment in the plan, that's most welcome because as others have said, we do need an evidence-based approach to all the decision making and uh, it's, it's, it's also very welcome that the Scottish Government's commitment to consider incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, <coughs> excuse me, I should perhaps declare an interest here with my members for the equal protection um, of children, um, uh, giving them the same protection that you and I would have and, and I welcome the Scottish Government's comments in relation to that. Um, it's essential that uh, children's rights are fully respected and um, w the, 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 there was legislation last year on um, the, the question of sharing imaging. It's, it's also important that we understand that technology advances and people's ways of visiting violence or intimidation and others have changed. Um, and uh, in relation to the ongoing um, work that we're doing with the domestic uh, violence bill, I looked at the stage one report and, and there was a phrase jumped out at me and that was the powerful and moving private testimony of some of the people that we took evidence from. Uh, and, and that was around the issue of coercive behaviour. And the challenge that there is for people to understand that in all 
uh, again, coming back to, to the, the judiciary and legal people, to, to understand that um, something is seemingly well-meaning as, as um, a, a, a children's access visit can be used to completely continue and perpetrate the abuse. That's well documented. Um, and, and also from, from casework, the trauma that thereafter is visited in grandparents who seek to mediate, mediate in these circumstances. Um, so um, th there is a lot of um, positive things happening and, and reference has been made to the growing um, uh, reporting of, of, of crimes against women. I want to take the, the, the notion, and going back to my comments about policing in the 70s, that this is a recognition that the police have different approaches now, that there is support in place, and the third sector organisations are there to, to, to support people who do come forward. So um, I think access to justice is, is hugely important. Hopefully, us discussing that takes that one stage forward. Thank you very much. We have Alex Cole Hamilton, followed by Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by reminding the Chamber that before my election to this place, I was a member of the Ministerial Task Force on Violence Against Women and Girls and helped to author parts of Equally Safe, the national strategy we debate today. I want to thank the Government uh, for an excellent motion and very much support the necessarily gendered nature of this debate and as such I am proud to stand shoulder to shoulder next to colleagues like Adam Tompkins and other men who've given excellent contributions today as allies in this global struggle against violence against women and girls. In January 2015 the world lost Dr Carl Gerasi who is a lifelong feminist and inventor of the contraceptive pill. I've mentioned him in the chamber before and it was my pleasure to spend an afternoon with him as he got his honorary degree at the University of Aberdeen. I was astonished to learn that prior, uh, during his research in the 1950s, prior to the release of Envoid, the first iteration of the pill, he'd come under pressure from politicians and senior management to develop an oral contraceptive for men. Such was the recognition of what the pill could do for the liberation of women in terms of putting family planning for the first time in women's control that it was a visceral reaction from the patriarchy to stop his work. Presiding officer, this is an example of the control that men have sought to exert over women for time immemorial. It is a spectrum of control which starts with cultural constraints on women that men fight to retain and ends with the worst forms of violence that we have heard something of today. Now, we live in more enlightened times, but we are still learning how far we have left to travel in terms of breaking up that spectrum of control. But in the year that's elapsed since the 2016 International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, new frontiers of our struggle have emerged. One such frontier was recently laid bare to us in the revelations to come out of Hollywood about the sexually exploitative behavior of several Hollywood moguls. Put simply, presiding officer, they've used their power and their status to abuse women. Such allegations have indeed fallen closer to home and it is vital that we in this place recognize the manifestations of this spectrum which have been revealed in the shadows of this chamber as well. And I welcome the proactive response taken by Parliament to allegations of harassment. In the same way, I welcome the tenets and aspirations of Equally Safe that we debate today. We might not be talking about physical violence in the workplace there, but harassment is a tool of coercive control, abuse and exploitation, and as such should be considered in the context of this debate. This form of abuse is widespread. 23% of women surveyed by Amnesty said they'd experienced online abuse and harassment at least once, uh, and nearly half of them had said that the experience had made them feel physically at risk. In 2014, and 2014-15, there were close to 60,000 incidents of domestic abuse recorded by Police Scotland. That is astonishing and heartbreaking. This problem is showing no signs of relenting, and just last week, UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said every woman and every girl has the right to a life free of violence, yet this rupture of human rights occurs in a variety of ways in every community. It particularly affects those who are most marginalized and most vulnerable. Now, the value of services like women's aid and rape, rape crisis, who I have worked with for many years, are undeniable in terms of providing support for victims. It is vital that the funding for these organizations should continue despite tightening budgets across our public and our voluntary sectors. They are undoubtedly key partners to our response to violence against women 
and girls, but we need to change our culture and the way we bring up our children as well. We need to teach children and young people about respectful, appropriate re relationships from an early age, and we need to model positive behavior. Indeed, it's small wonder that for many years, a range of stakeholders have challenged several domestic norms. They are right to point out that we shall forever remain adrift of our aspirations to end violence against women if we legitimize the use of any kind of violence in the home. As such, I am heartily glad that in the year that has passed since we last debated this issue, an insurmountable majority has been forged across this uh, parliament to end the physical punishment of children in this country through the private member's bill in the name of John Finney. Now, as I've said before, we need a dual focus in this agenda. And I will use the remainder of my remarks to focus on the end game here that's almost as important as ending violence itself. And that is trauma recovery. Because adverse childhood experiences, particularly experiencing or witnessing domestic violence, can have lifelong effects, which can reduce life opportunities. Now, if we get trauma right, recovery right, then we can build resilience and prevent the escalation of these problems to negative social outcomes. Article 39 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child lays out the right for every child to recover, but we are a considerable distance from achieving that for all too many of our children. An NSPC report, NSPCC report entitled Right to Recover revealed that 15 of 17 Scottish local authorities analysed had no dedicated trauma recovery services for the under fives. Now, we can't turn that reality around overnight, but we can look to models of best practice, such as the Barnhouse Pilot, delivered by Children First in Edinburgh, which delivers trauma recovery and allows child witnesses to deliver witness testimony without being re-traumatized. Most importantly, we can ensure that all of our universal services deliver an approach which is trauma-informed with basic CPD for existing staff on the impact of trauma on young lives. To finish, by bookending this terrible reality in our culture in this way, we can begin to bring about meaningful and lasting progress towards the eradication of violence against women and girls in our society. And I am grateful for the Scottish Government's efforts to foster consensus in their motion and assure them of our support tonight. Thank you. I call Ash Denham to be followed by Gordon Linders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over the last few months, countless women have come forward with their stories of gender-based harassment or violence. To our horror, but not to our surprise, women from Hollywood to here in Holyrood have spoken out about deep-seated power imbalances and attitudes that have induced assault, abuse, harassment or rape. And it felt, and it still feels, as if we are on the cusp of a watershed moment, that society has at last been provoked enough perhaps disturbed enough to collectively confront these profound societal failings that have given rise to gender-based violence. I certainly hope so. But each of us must keep speaking up and keep the spotlight on the fact that the vast majority of violent crime victims are women, that the vast majority of domestic abuse victims are women, and that the vast majority of those trafficked for sex are women. And in speaking up and pushing towards a true watershed moment, we must act by the theme of this year's 16 Days of Activism campaign, Leave No One Behind. And I welcome the Scottish Government's equally safe strategy and delivery plan because it attempts to tackle everything from changing and shaping attitudes through education to ending social, cultural, economic and political imbalances faced by women, as well as enhancing services around health, justice, housing and all in an effort to leave no woman or child behind. For example, the £1 million of additional funding that's been provided to teach school children about consent. Rape Crisis Scotland's sexual violence prevention programme will also be rolled out to a further 11 local authorities and an equally safe accreditation scheme will be available for employers to become equipped at inhibiting gender-based violence in the workforce. And these are real steps at solutions to preventing violence against women and girls. But in tackling gender-based violence, we must continue to target the behaviour of the perpetrators. Last year in Scotland, there were at least 150 victims of human trafficking. About half of those were women, and of those women, 92% of them were trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Today in Edinburgh alone, if you Google it, you will find that there are 138 women available um, that you can purchase sex from, and some of them are even able to be delivered like a pizza to your door. 
But women and girls are not commodities to be bought or sold, used and then discarded. A friend of mine, Yvonne Idahosa, who works to eradicate sex trafficking in her home state of um, Edo State in Nigeria, which is a source country for many of the women that are sex trafficked into Europe, and yes, into Scotland, alerted me to this recent story involving Nigerian girls that I'll come on to in a moment. And she works in this area because she believes, as I do, that these girls deserve better. Better than the abuse, the rape, the violence, and even murder that awaits them at the hands of traffickers, pimps, and punters if they make that journey across the desert. And this story is about 26 girls, aged between 14 and 18, who were found dead, they'd been sexually assaulted, floating on a boat off the coast of Italy. And I want us to remember these girls. Um, we only know the names of two of them, and we know that another two were pregnant. 26 girls, that's a school class. That's almost the number of the members, the seats that uh, members could sit in over there in this chamber. That's 26 children, really. Children with parents, children with siblings, children with talents and dreams of the life that they might have, found dead on a boat, a silent, floating coffin in the Mediterranean. Imagine it. Imagine being sold to traffickers at just 14 years old. Imagine your terror as you realize you may never see your home again, never see your family again. Imagine having to watch and listen as others are being beaten and raped in front of you and knowing there is no escape and you are likely to be next. Imagine being forcibly loaded onto an unsuitable boat in rough seas and then feeling the boat capsize and the water rushing in, hearing the screams and then the water crashing over you. Trafficked girls are routinely treated like this, we know that, because they're seen as less than human. And girls like these are trafficked and prostituted so their bodies can be used for the gratification of not just one man, but many men, or any number of men that can afford to pay. But you know what? Let's stop talking about the girls. What girls wear, what girls drink, what they do, what they shouldn't do, and instead start talking about the men. The men that rape, the men that hit, the men that buy underage girls to have sex with. Let's turn the focus onto these men that abuse and these men that are violent. Not all men, but these men. And let's send a message to those men that these behaviors are not acceptable. Let's send the message that enough is enough, that we are sick and tired of clearing away the dead bodies of girls as if they are less than human, as if they don't matter, as if any of this is somehow inevitable or excusable, as if we as a society will be complicit by keeping these secrets and looking the other way. Those girls were on that boat because the demand for young flesh exists in Europe and in Scotland. And as long as a man can pay to abuse women and children with no threat of consequence, the cycle of abuse where women have neither equal safety nor equal protection will continue and the bodies will continue to pile up. Our watershed moment is within our grasp for the sake of so many women and children who need our support, who need our action, we cannot let it pass by. Let's leave no one behind. And for the sake of the 26 dead girls on a boat and the many, many dead girls and women in Scotland, let's look seriously at challenging demand. I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Gillian Martin. Deputy Presiding Officer, Today's debate is a very important one, and I hardly need to say that, particularly following the speech that has just been given by my colleague Ash Denham. But as the British Deputy High Commissioner in Kolkata, Bruce Bucknell, said at the International Conference on Anti-Human Trafficking in recent days, I am disappointed that we still have to discuss these issues in the year 2017. We are talking about crimes that should have been confined to the dustbin of history long ago. As we have heard, significant UK government action and investment has gone into tackling gender-based violence across the world, with the Department for International Aid now having in place 127 programs, almost double the number from 2012, tackling issues such as domestic violence, acid attacks, and female genital mutilation. The prevalence of physical and sexual violence is still high, 
with around one in five women across 87 countries worldwide having experienced the problem within the 12 months prior to a study carried out in 2016. There are practices and attitudes across the world today that can lead to violence against women, and sadly, this also includes our own country. But there is positive work taking place to change some of these attitudes and behaviors. UK Aid is, for example, contributing to the Raising Voices program in Uganda, which seeks to change the stigma, discrimination, and attitudes around the acceptability of violence. Within communities that have benefited from the program, women are now reportedly 52% less likely to experience physical violence. But in spite of the UK taking a leading role in the world, we continue to face problems in dealing with the same type of violence here. Reports of domestic violence, rape, and attempted rape have been rising in Scotland in recent years, as mentioned by my colleague Adam Tompkins. Whether or not the rise in reported cases is down to increased confidence in victims coming forward, the fact is that these types of crimes continue to occur but let us hope that changing attitudes and behaviors for the future will see a reduction in violence towards women moving forward. Some of the crimes can be complex and varied and may require further measures to deal with them. It is understood, for example, that 170,000 women in the UK have undergone FGM, which is a particularly barbaric procedure with specific cultural roots. As the UK government has recognized, that type of violence can require its own report, uh, sorry, its own approach with legislative change to offer effective tools to victims, community lead leaders, and medical practitioners. And the benefits of legislative improvements are what some of my co Scottish Conservative colleagues have been highlighting today, and which I myself discussed in a previous debate at the beginning of the year, specifically on FGM. Scotland may in some ways appear to be lagging behind the rest of the UK in combating this horrific practice. The UK government has taken legislative steps to provide protection to girls who are potentially at risk from suffering from the procedure, as well as coming down hard on those who do not offer girls adequate protection or, or who actively seek to ignore its illegality. Organisations such as Shakti Women's Aid, based in Edinburgh, with outreach staff across Scotland, work with communities in Scotland where women are at greater risk of FGM or forced marriage or who have already experienced it. Now, I welcome that and thank them for it, but Scotland's justice system could do more to offer protection. And that is why we have today raised possible ideas for reform, such as court protection orders for victims and potential victims, mandatory reporting for professionals, and a new criminal offence for failing to protect daughters, amongst others. The government announcement around extra funding is to be welcomed, but it should go hand in hand with addressing other types of crimes against women that are happening here in Scotland, where tools to deal with the problem may be significantly lacking. So in closing, I would urge the government to reflect on those proposals so that those who have suffered from unacceptable violence here are not left behind. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's commendable that we're having this debate during the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. The Scottish Government has shown its commitment to safety for women and girls in Scotland through the Equally Safe Plan and investment in frontline, frontline services for those affected by domestic abuse and sexual violence. But combating gender vi violence and uh, inequality um, goes beyond any one government portfolio. It cuts across many of them. And the mainstreaming of gender issues is key to protecting women and girls from abuse. One key way to mainstream the fight against gender-based violence is by linking it with our education policies. This is the focus of my contribution to the debate. Early years in education policies are crucial to preventing violence before it happens. And I'm happy to note that one of Equally Safe's main priorities is that interventions are early and effective preventing violence. 
One of the most effective ways to prevent violent, unequal relationships is to explicitly and clearly teach children and young people how to develop healthy relationships with one another. This issue was raised recently in the Education and Skills Committee as we were looking at the personal and social education review being conducted by the Scottish Government and I'm pleased to see that the PSE review is part of the Equally Safe Delivery Plan. Uh, this action notes that the PSE review will allow the government to better consider how consent is taught within early years, primary and secondary schools. And I believe that the PSE and sex education that we teach in schools should go beyond the concept of mere consent when considering young people's awareness. We should be discussing enthusiastic consent. In recent years, the discussion around sexual health has moved on to enthusiastic consent which is about promoting a healthy, positive and open conversation. This enthusiastic communication should be present from the start of a relationship. To adopt this approach, in addition to a message of violence pre prevention, I would like to see more work on a message of healthy relationship promotion. And this must involve young people and their parents in shaping the messages around this. Because I'm afraid to say that things are taking an unhealthy turn. In what world is it okay for boys to coerce girls into sending them nude photographs on Snapchat or Instagram or other social media? In what world is it okay for boys to send unsolicited images of their genitals to girls? When did this behaviour become normal? I'm not sure, but in speaking to many young people in this, I'm told it's not just common, it is becoming normal behaviour. And how does that engender healthy, respectful relationships? I recently met with Bernardo's, who also contributed to the Equally Safe Plan through the consultation. Um, Bernardo's has taken a, forward a report from the Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice called Over the Internet, Under the Radar. We must also recognise that online abuse needs direct action. And I'm going to call on online platforms to do considerably more in sanctioning that abuse and working with law enforcement. The cooperation of social media with police is nowhere near good enough. And I have personal experience of that. And I say this to those platforms, stop protecting abusers by not releasing information you hold on the IP addresses to of your users when it's asked for in a police investigation, because that's what they do. This is a an issue close to my heart. I've been working with young Scott and local colleges to promote awareness of online safety for young people, particularly around the issue of coercion and harassment to share um, um, images online and the consequences of that behaviour. Today, I gave the green light to two drama scripts written by students of television production at North East Scotland College on issues around consent for image sharing and sexting. These will be used by Young Scott in their DigiEye campaign, which raises awareness around social media, consent, sexting and image sharing. These are films by young people for young people, getting messages around consent out in a platform that is used by young people. The, message of, uh, the method of messaging is as important as the messages and young people should be fully involved in the production of those messages if they are to be effective. Through my campaigning on this issue, I've also seen what Bernardo's has concluded. There is inconsistent and unsure handling around online sexual violence, not least with parents who are struggling to know how to engage with their children on these issues. Equally safe in the PSC review should ensure that particularly consider how online relationships may require different responses and further education of those working in our schools and public services. And we must also be supporting parents who are key influencers and to be honest need to know what they're dealing with and how best to handle it. Handle it. Just as our actions to combat gendered violence should not be isolated into one policy area, health and well-being education should not be isolated into one class or one subject area. These lessons should not exist in isolation. Schools should be able to respond to incidents such as those that arise around sexting um, effectively. This means taking a no wrong door approach to teaching health and well-being in schools. A child should know that whatever staff member they choose to communicate with around these issues knows how to support them. 
Presiding officer, I'm heartened to see the connections been made with early years and education policies in the Equally Safe Delivery Plan. The fight against gender violence and promoting positive messages around relationships must start in our schools from an early age. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to join with the Cabinet Secretary to recognise all the many women and girls who stood up against gender-based violence and encouraged others to come forward. Women across the globe have been standing up against the endemic nature of violence against them. And we know that it cuts across socio-economic backgrounds, continents and cultures, and women from ethnic backgrounds and those with a disability are at particular risk. Domestic abuse, female genital mutilation, rape, child marriage, so-called honour killings, it's a global problem and it requires a global perspective, as others have talked about. Natonia Sandy's first year as a teenager would also have been her first year of married life. Up to the moment that wa water swept away her parents' field in a district of Malawi, they had been scraping a life together. When a young man came to their door and asked for the 13-year-old's hand in marriage, the weather had changed everything from the family. There was not enough food to feed every mouth at the table. Natonia gave birth to her daughter before she was aged 14. Child marriage is a global issue. Millions of girls are forced into child marriage. Millions of girls miss out on their education and their lives because of it. Iraq recently dropped plans to allow girls aged nine to marry. So across the world, there's a big message to be received. As others have said, there is arguable, and I'm not the first person to say this, that recent revelations on the sexual conduct of men represents a golden opportunity to make an even greater paradigm shift toward women's equality. If we create the conditions for victims to be listened to and the victims see that things can change as a result of coming forward, we can make a greater shift towards women's lives free from violence. As Adam Tompkins and others have highlighted the backdrop of statistics showing an increase in violence is depressing, but it focuses our minds. I support the motion and the campaign Equally Safe, but I do think that what is missing explicitly from the motion is the root of the problem. And that is that men's power in society and the, the hold that they have in that power displayed in the relationships that exist between men and women. Men are still the dominant sex in almost every area of society. And it is, of course, abuse of that power, which is the problem. But knowing that that power is unlikely to be challenged and can be perpetuated, it means that those holding the power can behave as they like unchallenged. And it's that which has to change fundamentally for us to tackle these bigger and wider issues. Power cannot go unaccountable, it cannot go unfettered, and it certainly should not be passed down generations of other men, which is why we must see this as a watershed moment. As Engender points out, access to resources is a fundamental aspect of gender inequality. Economic inequality increases the risk of a woman being the victim of violence as it creates subordination within the home and at work in wider society, meaning many women are trapped. On average, women in Scotland still earn £182 less a week than men due to occupational segregation. And globally, women are still paid far less than men, and in some cases, 60% or 75% of men's wages. So the best hope of changing the status quo is to ensure that there are more women on positions of power, and that will not be done simply by good men volunteering to give up that power, but it will have to be women leading the fight alongside men. Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was the policy aide of Hillary Clinton, said, the best hope for improving the lot of all women is to close the leadership gap. Only when women wield power in sufficient numbers will we create a society that genuinely works for all women, but that will be a society that works for everyone. There are indeed 15 female world leaders currently in office, and eight of whom 
are their country's first ever women in power. And they represent just 10% of the 193 countries registered by the United Nations. You can see the extent of the problem. We've come a long way, but it is shocking to realise that it was only in 1989 in Scotland that rape was outlawed in marriage two years before England and Wales. In fact, the nature of violence against women shows that by far the most common perpetrators of sexual violence against women are current former husbands, partners or boyfriends. And it may go some way to explain partly why the abuse affects women's life is extensively underreported. Under Some national studies have shown, I think this figure was used already by another member, that up to 70% um, have experienced physical or sexual violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. I mean, 70% it is a shocking figure indeed. Europe-wide, we can see that the response of women across Europe, across the world, to well, the revelations of Harvey Weinstein's alleged sexual assault, where in France, for example, 86,000 women posted comments on social media. I thought it was worth mentioning that uh, Macron, the president of France, has just announced a new law against sexism, which will fine men who will whistle or who are lectures to women on French streets. Uh, whatever you think about that, you can see it's quite um, a strong response. Because what he says is that it's unacceptable that women feel uncomfortable in public spaces and women in uh, public spaces must not be afraid to use those spaces. Um, a close presiding officer, if I could, just with, with this quote from Cheryl Sandberg, who is the uh, chief executive of Google and, of course, a woman. And she says that a truly equal world would be one where women run half the countries and half the companies and men run half the homes. That may be true, but I think we would all like to start to see that women and girls can live their lives free from violence. Thank you. I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. As members have already reflected on, the motion before the Chamber today is an important one. This allows this Parliament categorically to recognise and mark her contribution to the 16 days of activism under the gender-based violence, but also to underpin our absolute understanding that violence against women is a fundamental violation of human rights. And we across this entire chamber are committed to tackling it. And I also stand with all in this chamber in that regard. Of course, the motion today focused on how we can practically make Scotland equally safe, the, pract the practical actions that we can all take, undertake, but also the responsibility that we all have. Equally safe, as members have highlighted, is indeed Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls. What that means, of course, is violent and abusive behaviour directed at women and girls precisely because they are women and girls. And I'm saddened to say that this behaviour is predominantly carried out by men and often stems from systematic, deep-rooted women's inequality and can also include domestic abuse, sexual assault, commercial sexual exploitation, and the so-called honour-based violence like female genital mutilation and forced marriage. And that's why I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to speak in today's debate, because as men, we must also take a leadership role in tackling these behaviours wherever they exist. And I would hope, as a result, contribute to the overall aims of the equally safe strategy which is to create a strong and flourishing Scotland where all individuals are equally safe and respected and where women and girls live free from such abuse. Those aims are entirely underpinned by four priority areas that Scotland society embraces equality and mutual respect and rejects all forms of violence against women and girls. That women and girls thrive as equal citizens socially, culturally, economically and politically. Those interventions are early and effective, preventing violence and maximising the safety and well-being of girls, uh, women, children and young people. And as I have already mentioned, that all men desist from all forms of violence against women and girls as perpetrators of such violence receive a robust and effective response. That we ensure through our court system and family courts that women are listened to and that women and children's rights are respected within those courts. 
Judges must, I now believe, attend training on this issue. Judges must address emotional abuse by men. Judges may, must now defend women. Judges should defend women and their children and get the true facts. Yes, the government has committed extra funding. I note the briefing from Children First and their proposals. Whilst I agree with their comments, I also say that we must safeguard our children before they get through that and have a better court help. These initiatives must also be reflected through social work and must ensure that the rights of women and children are upheld. We must resolve to stop violence against women and children. Whilst I have reflected my earlier remarks, President Officer, on where we are going next, which is absolutely the right thing to do, we never should be complacent in our actions to tackle systematic problems of violence against women and children. Because we have indeed invested and continue to do so record levels of funding to tackle violence against women and ensure victims receive the support they need. I understand between 2015-17 alone, 24 million has been invested from the Equalities portfolio to support a range of projects and initiatives, including a range of frontline specialist services working with women and children who have experienced domestic abuse, which comes from the March 2015 announcement of an additional 20 million from this government over the period of 2015-18 to be invested in a range of measures to tackle all forms of violence and put in place better support for victims. This has meant a boost in resources to courts and prosecutors by 2.4 million each year to reduce court waiting times for domestic abuse cases to ensure that there's no undue delay in court waiting times. These should be reflected by the courts where women should be listened to also. One last area I wish to look at, President Officer, is what I began with in recognising the wording of the motion before the Chamber, as we know, the 25th of November is the International Day of Elim Elimination of Violence Against Women and marks the beginning of the 16 days of activism, activism against general-based violence campaign. An international campaign which originated from the First Women's Global Leadership Institute. Let us be clear, in this chamber today we are speaking with one voice and saying that violence against women and girls and children in any form has no place in our vision for a strong, safe, successful Scotland. A society where there is violence against women does not reflect the country of equality we aspire to become. And that regardless of the form it takes, violence against women and girls can have both an immediate and long-lasting impact on the women, children and young people directly involved. This equally safe programme places increased priority upon primary prevention to conclude, President Officer, taking this approach demands that Scottish society as a whole begin with our Parliament today, spread out to the whole of our country, says clearly that we embrace equality and mutual respect, that together we reject all forms of violence against women, girls, children, and that women, girls and children should thrive as equal citizens, socially, culturally, economically and politically. Thank you. Call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's clear from listening to today's debate that we're all united by our desire to wholly and thoroughly eliminate violence against women and girls, to work towards a Scotland where everyone, irregardless of race, age, gender, and sexuality, can live free from the fear of violence and discrimination. Unfortunately, however, this is not the reality we live in at the moment. As the Scottish Government report has brought to light, violence against women and girls is still very much an issue and one which we must work to continually, uh, continually work to eradicate and prevent at its most basic roots. As the report pointed out, women remain much more likely than men to experience serious forms of sexual assault and harassment. For example, 8% of, of all adults in Scotland have experienced at least one uh, type of sexual assault since the age of 16. But this uh, statistic was comprised of 13% of adult women and just 2% of adult men. 
Upsettingly, younger women are also more susceptible to gender-based violence, with one in three 13 to 17 year olds reporting some form of sexual uh, violence from a partner in an NSPCC study. We must work to protect all members of our society from harm, thinking both in terms of support for victims, but also in terms of prevention, on how we in prevention, because that is the only way we'll stop these abhorrent crimes uh, from occurring in the first place. In this way, making Scotland equally safe is a bold statement of, an, of intent and a step in the right direction. Namely, its focus on prevention uh, and the cultural shift uh, it demands. The report's recognition of gender inequality and social attitudes as the root cause of this problem is both a necessary and welcome step on the path to eliminating violence against women and girls. Unfortunately, we are not as progressive as we would hope. Uh, and in regards to uh, social attitudes, uh, some things uh, still remain truly shocking. For example, only three in five people in Scotland think that a woman is not at all to blame for being raped if she wears revealing clothes or is very drunk. And as many as 5% of those surveyed in the 2015 Scott Send survey thought that a woman was entirely to blame for the crime if she was very drunk. In another harrowing example from the same survey, it was found that sexual assault was thought to be less serious when coming from a partner or husband than when coming from a stranger, with 88% of respondents saying that uh, a rape of a woman by a man she just met was very seriously wrong, compared with only 74% saying the same thing when asked what they thought about a husband raping his wife. Uh, yes? John Mason. I do thank the member for giving way. I don't know if you saw it, but the Traverse Theatre did a production in here which was kind of equally shocking about what men were saying about women. And I just wonder if he has any practical suggestions as how we take that forward as men, especially within this place. Oliver I, I thank uh, the member for that uh, intervention. I think that the biggest uh, thing we can do as men is to call out uh, that kind of behaviour very publicly uh, when we see it, and also uh, to work on a cross-party basis, as this debate uh, has done, uh, to make it very, very clear that that behaviour is not acceptable in our country and that people who behave in that way uh, do not uh, have the support of uh, ourselves or uh, society. Uh, and while I say that, I do recognise that some things uh, are getting better. Uh, young people in particular are less likely to victim blame, pointing towards societal progression. Reporting rates for crimes involving violence against women and girls are rising, uh, which it is uh, very unfortunate. However, we are making progress uh, on a global scale and movements such as the Me Too campaign, which a number of other members have mentioned, are helping create an environment in which women feel more comfortable speaking out about their experiences. The fact that there has been a marked improvement, however, does not mean, as I think the Cabinet Secretary herself has said, that we can afford to rest on our laurels, as there will always be more we can do to ensure that women and girls are protected from gender-based violence. One issue close to my own heart is the inequality in services and resources relating uh, to violence against women in more rural areas of Scotland. There are a number of local organisations doing good work in my constituency, such as the Dumfries and Galloway Domestic Abuse and Violence Against Women Partnership. These organisations are working hard, but they need more support in order to ensure that women living in all areas of our country have the same support and access to services as those living in more urban communities. I welcome the fact that an August uh, 2017 national scoping exercise of advocacy services of victims of violence against women and girls uh, conducted by the Scottish Government uh, openly identified uh, some geographical gaps uh, and noted uh, the urban rural split as one of the key issues uh, facing service provision. Women and girls in these areas uh, face additional barriers to receiving help, such as having to travel for forensic examinations and maintaining confidentiality in small communities where everyone uh, knows everyone. Additionally, there is often very little accessibility to advocacy groups 
uh, within some rural communities with some forms of violence against women and girls, such as human trafficking, prostitution, and violence specifically targeting LGBT communities being a particular problem uh, where there is limited specialist advocacy services. Presiding officer, while it's commendable that violence against women and girls is being treated like the grave and harrowing issue it is, and while things have been improving, there is more that needs to be done to ensure that every woman in Scotland has access to the help she needs, regardless of how rural or urban a location she lives in. Until we see these issues addressed, it will be impossible to ensure that Scotland is equally safe for all women. Thank you. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I had the privilege of speaking at the Glasgow Northwest Women's Centre on Saturday last, just there, at an event to mark the launch of the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence. Turned up with my wife and my wee boy, not in my capacity as an MSP, but rather just a member of the local community supporting a, a local event. Cameron enjoyed the face painting, the bubbles, the goodie bag. We had a, we had a lovely day there, the time we, we could be there. But it was a really pleasant and deeply humbling and surprise experience to be asked to say a few words at, at the event, um, at a day that was there to celebrate the empowerment of women. Um, the theme they had chosen was a celebration of women's strength, success and roles. And on the walls, they, they had about 20 plus pictures of uh, women from the Maryhill area who had made huge contributions to the local community, real female leaders over the years past and present. And it was quite something to see and take the time to look at. And I, I tell you, there's many, many more women could fill those walls. And it was just wonderful to see that. I want to see that here this afternoon. But... Um, I felt unusually sheepish about, about speaking and a bit unsure, given that advances in female equality and empowerment are not well served, usually by middle-aged white men bumping their gums. In fact, I don't think it's ever well served in relation to that, but I was asked, and it was a privilege to, to say a few words. The centre's chairwoman um, reassured me that it was actually important that I spoke, that it was important that men played their part and that the centre was welcoming and respectful of men despite some very turbulent and dis uh, distressing experiences that many of the patrons had had. To be fair, I knew the staff and the volunteers well at the centre, and, and I, I knew that already. Yeah, they do an amazing work. However, the reassurance in those circumstances was, was really welcoming in relation to my appropriateness to, to say a few words. But actually, in reflection, that was a bit silly of me, because actually... If this afternoon's debate has shown me anything, I didn't know what I was going to say this afternoon until I came into the chamber, listen to the debate. I've got a duty to show my solidarity with the women and girls that have experienced for many generations the abuse eh, and violence that they have suffered. I've got a duty to challenge my own complacency in relation to the fact that, well, I'm not a perpetrator. I don't particularly see it. Everything must be okay. In fact, I know that's not true because of my constituency caseload. So that doesn't even stack up either, but I have to tackle my own complacency. And I've got an absolute duty to contribute to those that are leading the, the fight in my local area to make lives better for people. But the experience also allowed me to reflect on the role of men, I suppose, more generally within this context, within the campaign to end violence against women. And of course, ahead of this afternoon's debate that I'm, that I'm speaking in, I thought Ash Denham, uh, in a powerful speech, called on us to turn our attentions on the men that, that do rape and hit women, on the men who buy children, on the men who abuse and are violent to females. But for me, I suppose the learning opportunity for myself from this afternoon's debate might actually be the converse of that, because it's perhaps that many men should turn their attention to the many who don't do any of the above. And indeed, uh, I think uh, Gillian, Ma Gillian Martin's contribution points also to the fact that the boys that don't do many of the above and what they have to do to play their part within society as well. So we have to turn our attention to the men who can say, well, I don't do it. Well, what are you doing to tackle the problem? Is what we have to ask because men are doing it. So I know quite often sometimes we, we, we look at the White Ribbon Campaign has been a symbol of, of that. And the White Ribbon Campaign is a wonderful thing. Um, 
And so this is not a reflection on the White Ribbon campaign, but we, I'll wear a ribbon uh, on Thursday for World AIDS Day when we come to First Minister's questions. Wearing ribbons becomes the thing that people do when there's campaigns on. But wearing a ribbon doesn't engage with the problem or the issue. It doesn't challenge the behaviour. It doesn't discuss and call out that unacceptable behaviour. So I think what men have to do, myself included, is find the space and the environment to make sure we do that all year round. So I think that's the challenge that I have from this afternoon's debate. I, I should also mention in relation to the White Ribbon campaign that Glasgow Kelvin College in Springburn, in my constituency, did something quite exceptional in May earlier in the year, where they actually had the college sign up uh, and become an accredited White Ribbon College uh, on the basis not just of signing a pledge, but actually activism on the ground, engaging with staff and students and the local community. Something meaningful around the White Ribbon campaign rather than that, putting it on your lapel to say you show support, but perhaps no more than that. So absolute credit to Glasgow Kelvin College. So every man's got a responsibility to do all we can to make a difference. So in closing, presiding officer, I'm setting myself a challenge rather than just turn up at an event uh, the Northwest Women's Centre uh, next year, as I'm sure they will have an event, and the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence comes around every year, is to make sure that I've managed to organise, shape and support a number of events in the communities that I represent, where men can stand up and speak up and support to end gender-based violence against women and girls. And then perhaps rather than just make a speech, hopefully a humble speech, in, this after, in the chamber this afternoon, feeling my way as I go along, I can actually do something that makes a little bit of a difference. And I've really, really enjoyed this afternoon's debate. Presiding officer. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Claire Baker up to eight minutes, please, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Um, 16 days of activism for the elimination of violence against women and girls was started in 1991 by the Centre for Women's Global Leadership Institute. Recognising gender-based violence as a human rights issue, these couple of weeks encourages activity at local, national and international levels. And this afternoon's debate has been wide-ranging, encouraging, passionate. There have been perceptive and persuasive arguments made by members around commercial sexual exploitation, FGM and forced marriage, and around education and consent. It has given Parliament an opportunity to add its voice to the campaign to end violence against women and girls and members have spoken about the violence and abuse suffered by women and girls here in Scotland and around the world, some of which we see daily on the evening news, but much of which is hidden or so ingrained in society that it is hidden in full view. But over these 16 days, we can also see examples of courage, of challenge, of resistance and calls for change from both men and women, boys and girls who do not accept the way the world is, who don't accept that one gender is inferior, who don't accept the prevalence of violence and abuse in our everyday existence. We have received a number of briefings for the debate from Engender, Zero Tolerance, Children First, Bernardo's, NSPCC and White Ribbon Scotland. And I would like to thank them for their expertise and the contribution their knowledge has brought to the debate. Um, I'd like to highlight a number of the speeches that were made. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton and Polly McNeill both talked about sexual harassment and I think both emphasise that this is not about sex, it's about exercise and power. It's about power and status, and that is the context in which we're having this debate. It's about how we value women and how women are represented. How do we change our culture? And I think it was Alex Cole Hamilton who talked about the way in which we bring up our children, that we have a responsibility here. And you know, I think the points made around John Finney's uh, bill that's been brought forward that will give children equal protection under the law, um, I think is relevant to this debate. But I think there's also an issue there about, I did mention in my opening speech, about how difficult it is to take a non-gendered approach towards modern parenting when so much of the marketing and commercial um, aspects that we deal with as, as parents is, is, so, is so gendered. Um, it's very difficult to buy children's clothes that aren't gendered, children's toys that aren't gendered, and I think that has increased in recent years. So you emphasise the difference between the genders rather than emphasising the equality. And Polly McNeill, I think, also brought a global perspective to the debate and talked about the millions of girls who have been forced into child marriage. And also about the debate we've been having um, recently around 
sexual harassment, it did lead me to question whether we are actually experiencing a shift. Um, is this a golden opportunity within our time? And you do feel a bit like the story moves on, that something else catches the eye of the world. Um, it is bizarre to have the discussion we've been having around sexual harassment and assault while Donald Trump is the US president. And it does really take us to continue to be vocal, um, to work to close the leadership gap. And it emphasises the importance of political leadership. You feel that those that control um, the way in which we learn our news or we, the forums in which we have this public debate are moving on to other issues. And it's important that we continue to highlight um, the, the, the damage that sexual um, harassment and sexual violence and sexual abuse causes to our society and the way in which it holds us back. And while uh, Polly McNeill mentioned the steps that Macron's been taking in France, and you can also see um, Justin Trudeau in Canada, who's very vocal about um, being a feminist, uh, we do need to hear more of this and we need to increase women's voices within this dialogue. Um, Adam Tompkins made effective points around highlighting our responsibility to care and support for all refugees, recognising that many are here because they are fleeing violence. Um, and if you look at the experience of women and girls coming from other countries which are, which are um, war-torn or they've come from very difficult and conflict situations, they have often within that experience sexual violence and assault and rape is used as a way of control and as a, we as a weapon. And perhaps here our services don't always recognise the additional vulnerabilities and barriers there can be for people around the language and their cultural um, understanding. And so I think that was well made points around where we could put a greater focus there. And the speeches from Ruth McGuire, Rosa Grant and Ash Denham made powerful and perceptive speeches around sexual commercial exploitation. And um, Ruth McGuire made strong points around the need for radical change, a belief that there's a weakness in the delivery plan and um, questioning how we can the document can recognize that commercial exploitation is recognize it as violence but at the same time allow the buyer to continue to exercise that to that right that there's um, <laughs> the legal system doesn't criminalize the buyer under the current system we have how does that complement or sit beside the arguments we are making around um, violence against women and girls. Um, so I think uh, the arguments made that we need a more robust and effective response, that we're not doing enough to prevent women being, being exploited were well made. Um, Rhoda Grant again made strong points around society's mixed messages, that how can we, um, how can commercial exploitation sit alongside arguments that women shouldn't be treated as commodities, that women should be treated as equals, that we should be valued human beings and um, equality should be promoted if we have a society that, the, that you could see as, as tolerating that type of behaviour. And I think our points around changes that have been made in Ireland and other um, countries about how they treat commercial sex exploitation does leave Scotland in danger of falling behind and being maybe increasingly vulnerable to increased level of trafficking to Scotland that's maybe seen as a soft option with those who are wanting to exploit this, uh, this industry and exploit women and girls in this way. I mean, Ash Denham made a very um, effective speech around uh, human trafficking, the recognition of women and girls as a commonplace commodity in a, in a global perspective. I mean, I think it, you know, our points around and the way in which she described the horrific experience of the 26 girls, shocking to think of them really just being teenagers, being 14 to 18 as an age. It's hard to imagine um, the horror of the exploitation that they experienced and how cheap a girl's life is within this context, all happening off the coast of Italy, where many of us go on holiday. And I thought it was a very powerful speech. So I think uh, the three speakers talked about this as not being inevitable, that it is inexcusable, and that we in Scotland must do more to disrupt the industry, to recognise this as a crime, to stop the trafficking and the slavery that comes with commercial sexual exploitation. Um, I thought Oliver Mundell's points around public attitudes were, were interesting. Uh, the public attitudes to rape and sexual assault victims and seeing women as being responsible for the crime. And they are shocking figures around um, public perception. And I understand that the public perception over a victim's clothing, clothing or their inebriation levels was from both genders. It wasn't a survey that was done exclusively to men. It was men and women who both responded and took part in that survey. And I think it highlights about how difficult it is to then pursue these cases through the criminal courts 
where they are often heard in front of a jury and the kind of prejudices that people have when it comes to sexual assault. And a number of MSPs highlighted the increasing number of rape and reported violence and sexual assault against women. And we need a justice system that fully responds to this. And last week we had the inspectorate report which highlighted the barriers faced by survivors in getting justice through the courts. And it was a very negative experience of giving evidence in court, some describing it as being worse than being raped. And we must look at extending measures to support this. And just one final comment that today we have had the news that David Goodwillie has lost his appeal in the civil rape case, which is testament to the courage of Denise Clare and fighting for justice for nearly seven years. She had to go to a civil court to get justice, and that's not acceptable. And we need to examine how we go forward forward after this case to ensure no other women have to pursue justice through this route, which is not appropriate um, for a rape case. So I'd just like to close on, on that point and say I think this afternoon's debate has been very worthwhile and has been a, a good expression of the Parliament's commitment to this issue. I call Michelle Ballantyne. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to close this debate for the Conservatives. I've sat here today and listened to everybody's speeches and, and the commentary and the passion and the emotion. And I think what it highlights is that this isn't a party political issue. This isn't one country issue. This is an issue that affects everybody everywhere. Um, I was lucky. I grew up in a safe household. I was brought up as a confident young lady. I was never made to feel that being female was any lesser than being male. But actually, in the 55 years I've been alive, I can think of numerous people that I know that have experienced being raped, that have been tortured, that have been victims of honor crimes, and I hate that expression too. And I'm really sad to say that one of my first early experiences as a student nurse was a lady who came in to give birth and begged us not to discharge her because her child was to be taken straight to the airport, straight abroad, to experience the horror of female genital mut mutilation. Back then, there was nothing we could do. We delayed her discharge as long as we could, but eventually we had to let her go. And I had the very sad job of taking that baby down to the car. And you can hear even now, I still feel really emotional about it. We have moved on, not as far as any of us would like but we have moved on. And today is another step in that. And the minister has, has introduced today some of the steps we're going to take in Scotland, and I hope we do, to make Scotland equally safe for women and young, young girls. I hope that in doing so, FMG will be something, that FGM, sorry, that will be something that never happens again in Scotland. And we never allow anybody to be taken out of Scotland to undergo that horror. One of the reasons things have changed is that we have changed stigma. Not as far as we'd like to, but it is much easier now to come forward and tell about what has happened to you. The police have done an, an immense amount of work in making a safer environment if you've been raped to come forward and talk about it. But I think as Oliver Mundell highlighted, it's not always good in some of the rural areas where you have to travel further and where your identity can't be hidden. So we still have things to do. I hope that the legislation we're bringing forward in the offence of domestic abuse is going in the right direction. And I hope as it travels through this parliament, we will iron out the debate points that we had the other week. And we will make sure that nobody who comes forward and talks about what's happened to them ends up going home still in fear. One of the things we are doing is recognizing the 16 days against gender-based violence. And by doing so in this parliament, it shows just how much our attitudes are changing. Um, and it also shows that we as a, a country must not take just a moral stance, but we must take a legislative one as well. We've heard about some of the laws that have come in across the UK and the ones we want to bring and help in Scotland. Adam Tonkins touched upon particularly many of the female refugees who sought sanctuary here in Scotland. They come often with added vulnerabilities, having already been abused or exploited even before they've arrived. 
Their cultural and linguistic barriers have also caused difficulties in helping those who need assistance the most. And he highlighted how we must re-examine this issue to make sure that we can give adequate support to some of these victims. The UK government did legislate in 2015 to protect young girls against female genital mutilation. And, you know, I really hope that we, the Minister has listened to some of the commentary today and will take up some of the actions to take that forward and make sure that Scotland also legislate against this. Annie Wells spoke passionately about the worrying trends we've seen growing in Scotland over the past year with domestic violence on the rise and the increase in the number of rapes and attempted rapes. And these are statistics we should be worried about. This kind of behavior is not only unacceptable, it does constitute a violation of basic human rights. And any increase in the number of incidents is to be noted with concern and should prompt action from the Scottish Government. She also drew attention to some of the excellent local projects such as the Archway Project in Glasgow and called for this project to be replicated. There are obviously many good campaigns across Scotland and what we need to ensure is that they have the necessary funding and that we make sure we support them not on a, an annual basis so that they don't know from one year to the next whether or not they're going to be funded but that actually they know that they are and they can offer continuity of support to the women and the children that, that they help. Gordon Lindhurst featured on some of the positive work that the UK government has done in the field to eradicate violence against women and children. There's 127 programmes addressing violence against women and girls, new domestic abuse legislation, and of course the introduction of the FGM protection orders. In many respects, the UK is ahead of Scotland here, and the Scottish government should be looking to adopt similar measures if they are serious about it. But I have heard what the Minister said, and I do believe that she will work to do this, and I will watch to make sure that it does happen. When we're talking about violence against women and girls, and we've heard a lot today, we've heard some very impassioned speeches from Claire Baker, Kate Forbes, Rhoda Grant. I want to remember, and Rhoda actually made this comment, that the vast majority of men are equally be horrified by the behavior of some men. And I think that is a really important point because we mustn't get to the stage where we vilify the idea that all men are perpetrators but we must make sure we identify those that are and hold them in abhorrence and make sure they are duly punished for their attitudes and the crimes that they commit. John Finney spoke eloquently about how gender-based violence affects the whole family and the need for judiciary training to ensure the victims do not suffer further victimization through the justice system. We are making slow progress on this but it is progress, but he's absolutely right, ensuring that those that sit on the benches, those that work in the courts, understand just how it feels to, to have gone through that and then to have yourself explored in, in a courtroom is really horrific. And we must make sure that people understand what that means and make sure that they're using the right language and the right attitudes and the right kind of questioning so that they aren't making things worse, not better. Alex Cole Hamilton did speak very well about the need to, to change culture and ensure that our children understand respectful relationships and have good role models. We are doing a lot of work in the schools and I, I welcome the extra money that's going in to ensure that that is enhanced. We must make sure that the attitudes and the cultures that underpin the decision making of our future adults is, is based in a good, good, gender um, respectful culture. Bob Doris. No, could thought, you come to a close, please? Yeah. Bob Doris, I thought, spoke very well when he said, as a man, he has the duty to show solidarity with those who have suffered, the duty to challenge his own complacency, and the duty to pay tribute to those who contrive to fight to make things better. I'm going to use those words to close out because I think actually that isn't just a duty for men. It's a duty for all of us, and I think he framed it very well in those three comments. Thank you.
I now call Angela Constance to wind up the debate. If you could take us to five, please. Cabinet Thank Secretary. you very much, President Officer. Today's debate is, of course, a very important opportunity to discuss uh, one of the most serious of human rights violations and indeed to uh, highlight the cross-party consensus that we have around this issue. And indeed, uh, I'm conscious that I've often spoke that one of the gains of devolution has been the cross-party consensus that has been built over the lifetime of this parliament. Uh, and everyone who's contributed in today's debate has made uh, excellent uh, contributions. But of course, President Officer, I don't want to be uh, too complacent or congratulatory because I'm conscious that in this place we can be guilty uh, of operating in our own uh, institutional uh, bubble. And one of the joys of chairing the Joint Strategic Board and Equally Safe with the full range of stakeholders is that they often uh, remind politicians to get out of our bubble and the strength of some of the participation projects that are feeding into the Equally Safe uh, strategy have indeed demonstrated that there are many people out there uh, that are less than aware uh, of the work that we're doing around uh, Equally Safe. I'm very conscious that in terms of the contributions made across the chamber today, President Officer, I think members have been particularly thoughtful, I think they've been particularly reflective, and at times uh, they've been particularly uh, challenging. And I think that is uh, in part due to recent events, as someone says, whether it's from Hollywood or to Holyrood, uh, no institution or part of our society is immune from the scourge of sexual harassment or indeed other horrors. And also today we've had the opportunity with the publication uh, of the Equally Safe uh, Delivery Plan, we've had the opportunity uh, to get our teeth into aspects of that plan which outlines 118 actions to be taken over uh, the lifetime of this parliament. And of course, Adam Tompkins, Annie Wells, Kate Forbes and John Finney, Pauline O'Neill and many others, I think rightly reminded us of the action that we need to take at both home uh, and abroad and they mentioned the international efforts of both the UK government and the Scottish government and that for anyone who's interested uh, is reflected in page 21 of the delivery plan. Members were uh, right to highlight uh, the challenges about going uh, further and faster with legislation and safeguards uh, in and around how we respond to uh, female genital mutilation. In the debate that we had earlier this year, um, I spoke of uh, this government's commitment uh, to take further action uh, over the lifetime of this parliament. We are indeed looking closely at the experience uh, south of the border. It won't necessarily be a shift and lift. We genuinely want to uh, look uh, and learn and we'll always uh, incorporate uh, what the evidence shows uh, to work well uh, and effectively. Another major theme from today's debate, presiding officer, was to really guard against survivors being re-traumatised, uh, either by their experience of justice services or indeed other services. And it is imperative that our services are always victim-centred uh, and trauma-informed. And the additional investment uh, to Rape Crisis Scotland uh, of £1.85 million it will indeed help with additional advocacy uh, and extend uh, services to Orkney and Shetland, picking up on some of the issues that Oliver Mundell uh, mentioned uh, with regards to uh, rural and more uh, remote areas. And could I could also say to Michelle uh, Ballantyne uh, that one of the reasons that I was absolutely determined uh, that the equality budget would indeed incorporate three-year funding is that I want organisations the length and breadth of Scotland who are supporting women and tackling violence against women and girls to be concentrating on what they do well, which is supporting women and their children as opposed to continuously uh, filling out forums. And the, my final point with regards to uh, justice services, there is a very important task force uh, chaired by the Chief uh, Medical Officer um, to ensure that we are constantly improving uh, services for children and adults who have experienced rape uh, or sexual assault. Now, presiding officer, uh, Rhoda Grant, Ruth Maguire, Claire Baker, Ash Demon and others spoke very powerfully uh, of the issue of um, uh, 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 
criminal sexual exploitation and prostitution and the relationship that commercial sexual exploitation has uh, indeed with trafficking. And of course, Ash Denham spoke very powerfully of those lost children, those children lost at sea, uh, children who were indeed victims uh, of human trafficking and other horrors. And Ruth McGuire uh, rightly spoke of the actions we are taking to reduce harm, to help women exit uh, prostitution and commercial sexual exploitation and the importance of raising awareness. But what I certainly take from uh, today's debate, presiding officer, is there is clearly uh, an appetite uh, for further action to tackle uh, the root causes uh, of uh, some of this behaviour. And I suppose what I can say to Parliament that while the research that was published uh, earlier this year it was inconclusive, and if I can be candid, that as a government we have not reached uh, some uh, final conclusions with regards to that research. I think it is fair to say that our work is not over and we won't be looking uh, the other way. The other important matter uh, that was raised, uh, presiding officer, is that while we know that women of all backgrounds and of all ages experience violence, women and girls from a minority ethnic background, the LGBTI community, or women who have a disability can be at greater risk of violence. And we will indeed work with others uh, over the needs of refugees and asylum seekers. One of my other responsibilities is to review and implement uh, the new Scots strategy. And of course, the, the UK contract on asylum accommodation and support uh, is also important uh, with this regard. And of course, uh, not without its uh, co controversies. Signing officer, can I uh, end by saying that our strategic uh, approach is drawn from the, the UN definition of gender-based violence, uh, recognising that it is a function of gender inequality. Uh, that is, it's an abuse of male power and privilege uh, that women and girls experience violence and abuse because, uh, quite simply, they are women and girls and because uh, that they continue to occupy a subordinate uh, position within our society in relation to men. And are equally safe, the delivery plan will be the cornerstone of our efforts to work together to eradicate violence uh, against women and girls. And we're doing that by changing the law invest in record levels of funding, taking action to support victims and indeed to tackle perpetrators and the underlying attitudes and inequalities uh, that create uh, the conditions. And ultimately, presiding officer, we have to prevent uh, violence and abuse from happening in the first place. And to do that, we have to recognise that progress is never permanent, that it's got to be redoubled, it's got to be restated, and it's got to be reimagined if it is going to survive uh, and indeed uh, improve. So I commend this motion uh, to Parliament uh, and indeed the Equally Safe Delivery Plan. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate on making Scotland equally safe. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9243 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme for tomorrow. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thanks very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 9243 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 9223 on committee membership. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. And we turn now to decision time. The first question is that Motion 9205 in the name of Angela Constance on making Scotland equally safe be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 9223 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Annie Wells on World AIDS Day. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. <laughs>